I'll have that really hard emotional conversation with her and will end in such a loving way. And then the next day, she's forgotten most of it and I have to have it again. Hello and welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today's episode delves into a sensitive topic that may be difficult for some listeners. We want to provide a content warning as we discuss the right to die in the U.S. Our host, Monica, is joined by Catherine Trueblood, who lives with Crohn's and Graves' disease and is also her mother's caretaker. Together, they explore the complex issues surrounding end-of-life care, including the difficult decision to respect a loved one's right to die. They also discuss the use of phenobarbital cocktails and share valuable resources for those going through this challenging experience. We understand that this topic may be emotionally challenging, and we encourage our listeners to prioritize their mental health and well-being while listening. Thank you for joining us today. I mean, just to give you some background, my mother has exhibited some signs of cognitive decline. She's 85 years old, so in the last year, but she took a major slide last spring. And for instance, I think one of the first big markers for me was when she told me that her bathroom drain was broken. And I went to her house and I looked at the the bathroom tub was about half full and she had a toilet plunger in there. I had been working on it, I guess. And I leaned down and I just pushed the lever on the drain and the bathtub drained. You're in that situation. I think a lot of us are really terrified of, which is being chronically ill and then also a caregiver. Yeah. Yes. Because I have Crohn's disease and Graves disease and interstitial cystitis and a bunch of other things. Another piece of this that I would like to talk about is since I have become a kind of self-inflicted expert on the right to die laws and how they affect people with degenerative diseases, because people with Parkinson's and MS and neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's or vascular dementia are all excluded from the death with dignity option. So you've become an expert in the right to die. And tell me about what this all means. All I know about is like Kevorkian and Oregon and the girl in San Francisco who had to move to Oregon so she could have the right in her life. Those are the more sensationalistic things, but they've gotten a lot of attention for a lot of reasons. The fact is that most Americans die in nursing homes. I read the book with my mother when she was 80. I read On Being Mortal by Atul Gawand because I thought, okay, these conversations are going to be so hard to have. So let me read this book with my mother. We're both readers and then we can talk about it. And that's where I learned that the majority of Americans die in nursing homes. And I think right now this has a huge amount of relevance because boomers have already gone through a lot, seen their grandparents, possibly their parents, I'm seeing my parents right now, and are saying, I don't want to die that way. I don't want an institutionalized, medicalized death. So that's what we're looking at. The right to die, I don't know all the states, but Washington, Oregon, Nevada, there are a number of states. But basically what the law says is that if you are deemed six months from the end of life and you have a terminal illness, and you're mentally competent, you may get that phenobarbital second all cocktail and take it home. Okay. But think of the people it excludes. If you have Alzheimer's or any form of dementia, it's very hard to determine when you're in the last six months of life. And you most certainly will not be in your right mind by definition of the disease. You have MS, you have Parkinson's. It's not considered a terminal disease, if you can believe that, because you usually die of secondary complications and not the disease itself. And so you are excluded from the death with dignity option. Can you please explain the phenobarbital cocktail as far as I understand, it's a fairly peaceful passing. When my Thanks. grandmother died and she wasn't given this option in Florida, she was forced to starve to death, um, which is significantly less peaceful in my mind. Is that a common practice? Is that what the other options are if you are choosing to end your life and you have no access to this? What are your options if you don't live in one of those states? 
So if you have a neurological disease, I felt some Alzheimer's or a degenerative disease like MS, you have very few options. And when my mother and I were first facing this, I wasn't just researching. I was at that point pretty obsessed because I didn't know what we could do. And I looked, I did contact finalexit.org, which is an international organization that believes people have the right to choose how they exit the planet. But at that point, those options are things like using helium and a helium hood and things that are much quicker than what they now call voluntary stopping eating and drinking. So I don't know if your grandmother's if that was a choice and if it was medically supported, if you choose to do voluntary stopping eating and drinking, which is a movement that is gaining a lot of traction, that's where somebody has comfort care. So they decide to stop eating and drinking, but they have somebody say they're a doctor is overseeing it and making sure that they have liquid morphine or liquid lorazepam if there's any anxiety or agitation or fentanyl patches. In other words, the forms of comfort care that are available so that somebody's passing can be fairly peaceful. And um, why are there all these roadblocks? And your research have you found to keep people from making their own choices? It's been interesting for me, even in my own family, to talk to people who have very different points of view. And my mother and I actually, she, she had to switch doctors because she had a doctor who wanted to talk her out of it. I suspect he was Catholic. And he's a very nice man, very kind. But, uh, you know, that point of view is somehow that you are taking God's will into your own hands. That's one argument. And that you shouldn't do that. So that somehow is a sin. The people who are very adamantly against this say, well, what's to keep somebody who's just depressed from doing this? Like having a bad day or, you know, and I think the amount of intention it requires is pretty high. And with the... Voluntary stopping eating and drinking, which is the only legal one open to you, you have to have a doctor on board. You have to have nursing assistance. So I, I don't think that someone who's depressed or mentally unstable is going to be able to be enrolled in that kind of a decision. Interestingly enough, the American Nurses Association has publicly stated that they validate VSAT as a legitimate and good way to die. How are you dealing with, with family members who have different opinions than you? In my reading, I, I did run across and one person, he's, he's an Episcopal priest who's written quite a bit about it. And he said that when we assume that we know how someone else should die, we are ourselves playing God. John Abrams is his name. I was getting ready my responses to them. For me, there's no confrontation there. They have their beliefs. I have mine. But I do know in my county here in Washington, for instance, I got connected to this kind of whole community of people. And they're somewhat underground, as you might imagine. And in three cases, other family members challenged what they were doing, which meant that somebody from elder care came over to make sure that the person who had chosen B said, had done so willingly and was not coerced. And last week, my mom and I just made a video of her so that if anybody challenges us in the middle of the process, I can show them the video. That would be my fear for you is that you yeah. would get into legal trouble if you were the one who had made that choice or not. It has to come from her and she has yeah. to have decision-making capacity. But we've also had it put in our healthcare directive. So the laws in Washington have evolved enough that lawyers are drawing up health care directives that say that this is what the person wants to do. If they say by explicit verbal statement that they wish to be said, or if they wish to be said by bodily gesture or action, because there are people in nursing homes who are turning their heads who do not want to be said. And there are lawsuits from people who have had it in their health care directive, do not feed me. And then a nursing home has to say them. So I wanted her protective under any instance of this. We live in the United States where nursing homes can cost up to like, I think $40,000 a month is the most expensive nursing home I've heard about. And it goes up when you're dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's care. And yeah, so there's a financial component where there is some people who think that 
this kind of thing is done to keep a family from going bankrupt or that people could be coerced or that they would make that decision out of finances. And this is where capitalism meets humanity in the most cruel and gentle Yeah. And someone could make the accusation against me that, oh, I'm doing this because I want my mother's money. So, you know, and it's too long. I mean, I felt that with the one doctor who was trying to persuade my mother out of it, that in some way he regarded me perhaps as a daughter who didn't want to do the care and the devotion. And that was not a good moment. How do you handle that when you're, that's the most insane <laughs> cruelty. And let me be clear, I am certainly not saying this about Catherine. I'm just saying that I've had friends who have caretaken for their family members where they've had to pay like ten to $20,000 a month. And not that they were making those straight yeah, up just, here. Yeah, up here, 9,000 a month. That's memory no. care where I live. And I live in up in, you know, Washington state where things are less expensive than California. And I've had friends whose parents spent four or five years in a memory care unit and it just drained everything that the families had. And I mean, and that's not my mother's wish. If my mom yeah. wants to go into assisted living in a nursing home, I would say I would support her. And in some ways, even emotionally, I don't know that there's any easier, right? But it's, it is very painful. The difficult thing with voluntary stopping eating and drinking when a person has dementia is that they have to make that decision while they have mental competency, while they can choose it, which means that at that point, they also still have quite a bit of good living left. It's a trade-off, right? They're choosing the autonomy and the control and not to spend years in a nursing home while their brain is dying or is dead. They're sacrificing quality of life and they're having to say goodbye to people before they might otherwise have to. And that is right now tearing my family up. How are you guys handling this? How can you handle this as a family? How is she able to to deal with this now, even as she's declining? Well, we've cried a lot together. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that. And um, she has a great sense of humor. She's really funny. She's mad that she can't drive anymore. So, for instance, yesterday we, we went crab fishing as a family. <laughs> yesterday we threw out crab pots and. I had this beautiful day with my kids and my brother and his wife and my husband and I, we all went out with her on a boat and, and uh, my brother is, has a, lives on a boat. So we all went out. And, um, but when I was in the parking lot, we went to get sandwiches and I left her in the car and I left the keys in the ignition so she could roll down the window. And I said, mom, the keys are in the ignition. I said, don't drive anywhere. And she looked at me and she goes, not unless my dog tells me to. And she's laughing. She's making fun of the fact that she's kind of losing her marbles. Lots of humor, but we're struggling with, it's a Sophie's choice, right? Yeah. And there's no good decisions right. here. And there's so many roadblocks you're dealing with to get to the decisions that you would feel the most comfortable with and that she would feel the most comfortable with. What my mother wants, and this is the hard thing as her memory erodes, is that what she wants is to be able to take pills and have it be over. And so she's getting more forgetful. And so we're getting closer to the window where we have to choose. And that's something we're facing next week with the doula. We actually have a death doula. Can you explain a death doula for everyone? Yeah, a death doula is somebody, in this case, our doula has been a registered nurse for 35 years. And she was a registered nurse in labor and delivery. And I see this a lot where a labor and delivery nurse later in life becomes a doula for people who want to die at home. This particular doula specializes in VSED. So she's been doing it for five years. So she's the person that really, to me, has the most experience, more than the doctor. And she will help hire the 24-hour care that we will need. We will need nursing assistance. She will help communicate with hospice. It's a really strange thing. So here's how hospice works, right? And we have a Catholic hospital here in this county with a huge Catholic health foundation. So, but hospice has decided to be progressive after some years of saying they wouldn't come when somebody was in VSED. So if you go back to that law that says somebody has to be six months from the end of life, hospice won't come until your family member is in a semi-conscious state or in a coma. And they will come. So you have to hire your own team to be in. Money gives you better choices. I'm in the position where we can hire a doula and we can hire people in that interim 
But I mean, this is absolutely an economic question. And if you were doing it and wanted to keep a family member out of pain and couldn't have the doctor in charge of it, my brother lives in another city and I feel really horribly alone with this a lot of the time. And this woman has made a huge difference for me emotionally because I'm and when I can talk to. That's so wonderful that you found that help. It's very hard to balance your needs in the middle of something like this. I think the biggest weight also is, is choosing, right? Phyllis Schachter is very big in the movement. She wrote a book called Choosing to Die. By a series of coincidences, several years ago, oh, I knew that my mother never wanted to be in a home because of her personality. And she'd made that clear to me. So I started to going to things. In, in Washington, we have a movement called the Death Cafe, where people meet to talk about death and ways to die. And so I attended a workshop. Uh, Phyllis Schachter attends the Spiritual Center here in Bellingham. I knew of her. I had met her. And I went to one of her workshops. And she's an amazingly forthcoming person. She went through this with her husband. But for instance, what they encourage you to do is choose a marker. All right. So if you're the person who is going to have to choose to be said. So in Alan's case, her husband's case, he said, if I can't go to the Center for Spiritual Living and attend services anymore, that's my marker that I should start the voluntary stopping eating and drinking, right? And other people, it might be when I can't read or write anymore. And you have to sit down with your parent and make a list. You have to sit down and make a list of the things that bring you joy, the things in your quality of life that you don't want to forget how to do, like cooking or reading or eating. Or, you know, my mom said, if I can't walk my dog anymore, that was her marker for when she wants to go. But there are even complications in that. My mother, you know, she's physically so strong. And so in some ways her mind is going, like she's atypical. She can still cook and get dressed. Whereas some people like that would give up they would not be able to do that, and that would help be a sign that my mother is losing her memory, her actual conscious memory, but she's got this kind of autopilot from having lived alone for so long that, you know, I'm thinking she could probably still fry an egg for breakfast when she can't do anything else. It's hard for, I think, people with chronic illness to evaluate that decision as well. A lot of things you've said, I know that a lot of people are listening or going, yeah, that's not possible for me, but I'm not. At this point, so I want to be really clear that what we're talking about is someone who knows where their decline is going. They have to make choices right now. I want to be very clear to everyone who has chronic illness. We're not saying that if you have Ehlers Danlos or you have fibromyalgia or you have the other things where walking your dog is not possible, we're not saying that that's your marker. We're saying that this is a specific situation. No, the markers are very, very specific to a person who has a terminal disease. And you have to determine what your quality of life is. And this is no easy thing to do. It takes tremendous determination and resolution. Speaking of, you are obviously not the only person dealing with this. And there's going to be a huge generation of people in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years yes. who are going to be right in your shoes. Right. What would you give the advice to? You've been through a lot of this already. What would be first steps from like getting a diagnosis and moving from there? I have to be honest. We'll see if my mother makes it through this, right? It's perfectly possible. People decide day three or four, I don't want to do this. My mother's got a very strong will, but her mental capacity is not what it once was. And so you have to be resolute and to remember why you're doing it. And so, you know, she's getting more childlike. She wants things to be simpler. We'll talk in six months, see, see if that's what, that's what we're planning on. That's what her decision has been. And I ask her constantly if she's changed her mind or would like to do something else. And the answer is never different. I found the website by Phyllis Schachter enormously helpful. I found the organization called Compassion and Choice Online enormously helpful. And they're volunteers you can call and talk to. And they're super kind people. Uh, that was the, the Hemlock Society. It became Compassion and Choices. And there's Compassion and Choices Washington. If there is a Death Cafe organization, contact them. 
We also here in my state, we have a thing called the Palliative Care Institute. But you, what you will find is that almost everybody in the medical field will assume that you are now on a trajectory to assisted living and a nursing home and that you aren't to question that and that that's just where you're going and that it's time to do acceptance and be positive about it in some way. How do you deal with fighting against that tide? I Oh, it's been interesting. My mother had a neurologist who told her, she said, I don't ever want to live in a group home. And he said, well, ma'am, you may not have a choice. And my wow. mom right at him and said, I can stop eating and drinking. Our exchanges have not all been comfortable. And he said, you're right. That is your right to do so. But he said, I have never assisted anyone in dying. So, Yeah. It's been a lot of anxiety. Every time we go to a lawyer or a doctor, I'm like, okay. And then, but we found a lawyer who was tremendously progressive and was speaking at the Palliative Care Institute. And I had no idea who he was, right? So you, you got to kind of feel it out. I would say before you go in to talk to a medical professional, you need to try to find the community of people who believe that this is a kind and compassionate choice that we all should have, Okay. And once you find them, then they connect you to the rest of the community. But it was very hard for me from the outside with a Catholic hospital. I mean, those first weeks when my mom's longtime doctor tried to convince her out of it, I was like, what do we do? Where do we go? When I started reaching out and finding people who said, oh, well, if you try this particular doctor's office, their, their doctors are younger and more progressive and you might find somebody. And I got the help I needed. Just to be clear for everyone, if you're in the United States, you might need to check in your area if your hospital's Catholic owned. I'm not going to read any religion. I am going to say that if your hospital is Catholic owned, your care for many things, and I would like to underline many things, will mm -hmm. be very different than if you go to a different hospital. And they aren't always named things like Saint so-and-so. So it's very important that you know, especially if something traumatic happens or there is a big thing happening, that you know if your hospital is Catholic or not, it will absolutely change what kind of care you are going to get. And if your local hospice organization is run by a foundation from that hospital. I mean, even the way they, the language, right? So somebody who is opposed to be said is going to call it assisted suicide. So. Yeah, those are very good keywords to listen for and to look at in the literature to even decide if you need to make that phone call. If this is something that you need to research or look for, we'll have it all up in the show notes to, to take a look at. Absolutely. So I also just wonder how you're taking care of yourself. I'm right. so worried about you. I mean, we are also friends and we email back and forth and I am constantly worried about you and how you're handling your health and your mental health. This is a lot. And to not have your family support the way you should. You are support to a lot of people with health, physical and mental, the whole, whole part of it. My brother has been coming once a month because he lives in another city and I take a long weekend and I have reached really close to breaking point. I went camping by myself for five days, which I've never done. My daughter was supposed to go with me. She couldn't get with me at the last moment. My husband said, I don't suppose I can talk you out of this. I was basically like, buddy, stand aside. <laughs> I viscerally <laughs> feel that. I mean, and I'm really lucky. I've been in remission for a long period of time now. So that is one thing that's been really good. And I was working full time last year and I just was constantly on prednisone and off again. But I've moved to part time and it's keeping me in remission. Just more rest. Hello. You're not good resters. You're not a good rester at all. Can I honestly yeah. believe that chronic illness and disability, that there is this component of singing for your supper and yeah. earning your space. And I think that so many of us will go to the mat and the wall and light ourselves on fire to warm other people just to prove that we should be here. Yeah. No, first with the right to exist. My dad was a ex-military captain. So it's the, you know, suck it up, drive on and don't be a whiner. And I you know, mm -hmm. got all that in spade. So yeah. what but do I, people around you do for you? That's something that a lot of people struggle with is when your friend gets bad news, the person you love gets bad news, how can they help? And then also 
if you're a family member of someone who's coming to you with a decision, either the right to die or not wanting that and you disagree, how can they approach that subject? If you have any thoughts on what would have helped you? Well, I would say the hardest aspect of this for me right now, what's killing me is that I'll have a super hard conversation with my mother. Okay. So we have to get ready to do something. We're going to have a conversation with the doula or we have to have a conversation about what time frame she might have still to make, to be in this window of conscious and rational decision making. And she'll say things to me like, well, I don't, I feel so alive. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I'm dying. I'm like, well, you're not physically. That's the decision. You're make, you're physically very strong, but she's adamant that she doesn't want to be in a nursing home. But the thing is, I'll have that really hard emotional conversation with her and we'll, and in such a loving way. And then the next day, she's forgotten most of it. And I have to have it again. And so the Groundhog Day aspect of this, I keep the, the heavy lifting is really destroying me. And I'm writing it down and I'm recording our Zoom sessions for her. This week, my brother came to spend a week of vacation here because I just said, I can't, I just can't keep doing this. And he was shocked. The two of us went and had a big conversation with her. And then he was shocked that he had to do it again. Like he wasn't expecting that. Yeah. And then she wants a lot of reassurance. She'll say to me, I'm going to be in my home, right? I'm like, you're going to be in your home, mom. No one's ever going to lock me up. No, mom. No one's ever going to lock you up. I mean, the level of people think about Alzheimer's and they don't realize my mother's humor is there. Her intelligence is there. And her awareness of what is happening to her. Her awareness that she's losing her memory is there. And so they call it this disease, the long goodbye, right? So that's, that's the emotional part of it. But the time I do say goodbye to her, it's going to take me a lot to get my resilience back. I, it meant so much to me when I found people in my community who were God helpful and understood where I was coming from. So I want to be helpful to people. I'm so grateful you're willing to because there's so much uh, any topic that has a shroud of shame to it means that people get isolated. And when you have doctors who are saying things like you just don't want to care for your relative, that instantly isolates oh. and puts you into a spiral. And this is something we have to be able to talk about openly and honestly. Not one of us is not going to be affected by this someday, somehow. I mean, my mother's first doctor had very old world opinions and when my mother said, I don't ever want to be in a nursing home. And he said, well, basically in his mind, a nursing home was kind of like a luxury. He grew up where everybody decided to take care of whatever family member had Alzheimer's. He goes, if you get to be in a nursing home. So to him, that was a luxury, you know, and, and I, I had to stop and think of that. And then I came home and I talked to my husband and my husband's family were refugees in a detention camp after World War II. And I came home and I said, how can a doctor who says to me, that if he gets in really bad shape, he's going to walk off into the snow. How can he feel that voluntary stopping eating and drinking is any less of a natural way to die? And my husband said, it's old world. He said, starvation is something other people do to you. I didn't understand that exchange at all. You're going to encounter all kinds of attitudes out there. If you're dealing with people in your own family or your own circle who are questioning what your parent is doing, I just would come back and say, this is her choice. This is what she wants. And I'm trying to honor what she wants. And again, I mean, I sort of started off with the quote from the Episcopal priest about, you know, who are we to? assume how somebody else should die. I have to say, my mom would keep saying to me, this is so terrible, we have to keep talking about this. And then I read a Tibetan Buddhist view of death, and one of the things that it said was that the more you talk about death, the more familiar you become with it, the more it will enable you to be relaxed and present mm -hmm. when the time comes. And so I learned to stop seeing it as this terrible thing we had to talk about. But I just said, mom, this is great. We were getting really good at this. Did you watch the last season of The Good Place? I didn't. Should I put it on my list? I yes. My uncle just died, I think it's like two years ago, of brain cancer. And my mom's still in deep grief about it. And 
the last season of The Good Place. I don't want to ruin anything for you because it's it's a stunning season, but it's the last episode. And there's this discussion of the wave is an a wave. It's it's yeah. its own thing and it catches the light and then it crashes on the shore and it becomes a part of the ocean again. It was one of the most beautiful explanations and the only way the good place could do it but it was beautiful and also when breath becomes air was a gorgeous book well that was a local anthe that was a yeah. gorgeous book and that was a, a heart-rending gorgeous book yeah by someone yeah. again that the level of self-awareness my husband's father died of parkinson's which is one of those degenerative diseases not covered under the right to die act and there is a dementia component there and my mother's best friend doesn't come and see her she's five miles away is it because she's uncomfortable with this or maybe i'm trying to be as open-hearted as possible because i know her own father had vascular dementia so maybe she she was calling my mom and maybe she just can't handle it but people write you off really fast one of my cousins that i talked to it's like he kept saying well i should call her and then when i told him what she had he never called it's like, she's not gone, you know? <laughs> There's so many parallels with disability of if you're not the person, that everything that people remember of who you are, it, they just kind of shrug and shuffle off. Uh, the isolation yeah, of this is. is what kills me. It's something that makes me so sad. And it's why it's so important to talk about these things. Well, there was one thing I did like in the films, not only alice but also there was one away from her with julie christie mm -hmm. very honest films about aging dementia in one case obviously early alzheimer's but um the spirit remains the same you know i joke with my mom i go oh, okay you can't pay the bills so big whoop you know like you're you're offloading you're offloading the garbage okay so that you can focus on your higher path that's what I believe. What a beautiful way to look at it, that you're just becoming the pure form of who you are. It's so lovely. She's so beautiful. I even feel that she brings out, like, I'll go down there and I'll just be in a rat's ass exhausted maiden. Because she lives a quarter mile from me. So I'll go down to her condo, right in the neighborhood. And I'll just, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm my worst. And she opens the door and I look in the vulnerability of her face. And I do, I just feel like some kind of grace touches me because I'm always able to to pull out my better self and be good with her, you know? Yep. And then so it's a lot about you. Yeah. I take rat's ass back home with me. I'm a professor, right? So I think, oh, I, I am the uh, accumulation of all this information that has made me smart person. Well, all that knowledge only mattered in as much as it allowed you to evolve spiritually. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Interesting well, that we decided smart. And what situations are more about heart feeling and have nothing to do with all the education you receive? It has been a really interesting for me as an educator, a journey to seeing someone who's also educated and a very smart woman and watching that part go and then seeing all this beauty of what else there is, how deeply um, she's very deeply and spiritually aware of what's going on. I mean, she reaches out sometimes and rubs my back and says, you're so alone with this. I don't want this for you. Yeah. I adore you. I, I wish I could help more. So I have a way to be able to speak about it. And I honestly just really want to help anyone else who is struggling. And if you have a parent who doesn't want, who knows, or if you yourself have a degenerative or, or neurological, and you know that uh, that's a very powerful thing that you don't want to be in a nursing home. There is a huge movement out there. We have a website in Washington called End of Life Washington. If you have a death with dignity law in your state, look up the website. Because the people who push to get this legislation through know that it's flawed, there's all kinds of information there about VSED, about voluntary stopping eating and drinking. There are dementia care directives, health care directives that were written to cover dementia for people who might be in assisted living or a nursing home with dementia who don't want to be fed. All that stuff is there because people realize that the law is faulty. And this is about personal choice as well. I just want to make sure that we're very clear with everyone. This is about someone's choice and what they want, because there is a lot going on right now with COVID where 
disabled and chronic illness people are going into their doctor's appointments and are being asked questions like, do you want to change your care directive? No one else is being asked that, but people with disability are being asked oh, that. So again, so end of life Washington. Yeah. Just recently posted several pages about COVID for people who are either quite elderly or have terminal or chronic illness. And I have actually got two friends right now in end stage cancer. So it's a huge question. Yeah. Because when you go into that hospital, right, that's the last you're going to see of anybody that you love. They won't be there with you. And when you get put on a ventilator, you are heavily sedated. And that is the last time you will speak. Yeah. And if you don't have a healthcare directive that says, don't put me on a ventilator. I read the stuff there because of my mother and, and, you know, she has family members. If it were to happen to her, what would we do at this point? Yeah, I just want to be really clear with this conversation that everyone knows that what we're talking about is that someone has a personal choice that is their personal choice to make on how they wish to die with dignity in the way that they want to. That This is not a decision that gets made by others, by doctors. This is a personal choice. And what we're talking about is ways to help people with this personal choice and ways that people who are supporting them with that choice have support and especially with mental decline disorders. We're dealing with two very separate issues in the United States and we're dealing with a, a group of people where they're disabled. So if someone actually kills them, we had a whole issue where a woman mother killed her autistic son and there was a lot of people saying, well, there was a lot of apologies for her. There are a lot of people I know in the disability community who, when they're going to their doctors, their doctors are actually pushing them to sign directives that they don't want to be resuscitated. And there's a lot of push for that, which is very weird because <laughs> then you have this other side of people are saying, I am going to die and I want to die with dignity in my own way. And right. then those people are getting all of these blockades against them. And it's this very weird thing of we're yes. not letting anyone have a choice. And yeah. it sounds complicated. It's not. Everyone gets a choice. Well, it is each person's informed. It should be informed choice. Yeah. And what I was saying when I said that there's new language about COVID at the end of life website is that simply they are telling people, here is what will happen to you. And again, most of us think if someone dies, we should call an ambulance. You don't have to call an ambulance. You should just call your doctor. Yeah. You, know, you just need a death certificate and a coroner's report. And there, was, and there are these kind of preconceptions that I always had, right? Washington is saying, no, here's another series of things you can do if you do not wish to die in a hospital. Absolutely. And there's also some great books about what to do if someone you love who's been chronically ill or if you're expecting the death, there's like a whole bunch of great books on how to handle death in a way that is good for you and your family. From Here to Eternity is one of my favorites for that. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible mortician and I think she lives in LA, but she has a podcast. She has all these books about what the laws actually are. I agree with you. And I also want to be very careful and very clear. So for instance, Final Exit has been dealing with a lawsuit. They, you have to apply. They do have guides, right? If this is, it wants to go some route that is not visa, and this is primarily refers to the inert gases. But they had a situation where a woman lied to them who was mentally ill, saying that she had a terminal disease and they didn't do the homework on the documentation or she faked the documentation because they require a signed statement. So people are trying very, very hard to keep this to the population that is at end stage, end of life choice. Yeah. But it's messy. You know, there are times when things arise. There are so many issues with the woman from San Francisco to move up to Oregon. She had a brain tumor, I believe. I forget what country it is, but they do have everything very legal. And Switzerland, people are flying, people who are wealthy or can afford it or are willing to go into debt to do it are flying to Switzerland because Switzerland yeah. pretty much support anybody's rational decision and choice. And again, more money means more choices and better choices. <laughs> but that is an option if that's something that, that people are looking at and want yeah. to learn about. And I'll, I'll try to find the links to that. And again, we're not, we're only supporting people's choices. That's all we're doing here. We're not 
trying yes. to Yes, and I mean, the voluntary stopping eating and drinking, the way that when I say that the Nurses Association of America has approved it, is that it's a way for someone to exercise autonomy that is natural in many ways, which is that very often people in end-stage illness do not want to eat and drink anymore. It's one of the oldest things that the body does. For us as a family, it is a natural form of death. You could say that. The comfort care, the palliative care is there so that somebody is not suffering. But you get to be home and together. And I guess for me, you know, it's very clear that the person themselves has chosen it. You're not dealing with issues of violence and liability and things that could be very not only mucky, but for survivors, traumatic. I just um, encourage people to go ahead and buck the status quo because these options are need to be talked about more. We need to have these conversations like what we did today was essentially let's sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about death because we are such a death phobic society and we don't do it. And so take a deep breath and and, and put your foot on that bridge. You will get to the other side and you will be okay. And you and your family member will be closer because the worst thing is for to have a family member in a health crisis and to have no idea what they want. That's very true. That leads to so many broken families and so yep. much heartbreak. Yeah. It is, as heartbreak. hard as it is, talking about things is almost always better than not. Yes. Yes. So, thank you so much. I know this was one of the hardest interviews I've done, but I absolutely adore you. And thank you for coming on to talk about this. If you have any questions about what we've talked about, if you go directly to the show notes, I will have everything up there linked up and set up. If you are from a different country and your country handles this very differently, please feel free to reach out. We we very much like to hear how different places handle different things. We I think all of us live in our own little bubbles and we don't necessarily know what's going on in other places. So I would love to hear from other places that how you're handling death and these kind of issues of the right to die. Thank you so much, everyone. Be kind and be gentle and in whatever way it looks like to you, be a badass. And thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for all that you do and give to the community. You're a treasure. Oh, I love that, especially on a Monday. Thank you. Thank you.